Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce today for a very special occasion to talk about the power of music as the language that connects and inspires people and businesses throughout the Commonwealth. Music has such an important role in all of our lives, and no matter where you're from or how old or young you are, music is something special and it resonates with all of us in unique ways, which are special to each and every individual. Even in the realm of business, it's one of the most dynamic and growing industries worldwide. Last year in 2021, the international recorded music market grew by 18.5% with revenues of over 25 billion US dollars. And it's expected that the industry will continue to grow at a compound annual rate of 8.5%, with revenues reaching over 53 million US dollars by 2030. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an accelerating factor in the increase in online music sales via streaming, which now comprises around 65% of the total music industry. And these revenues catalyzed by uptrends in online content creation seem pretty unstoppable. So we're especially delighted to be joined today by the composer in residence of the Commonwealth Youth Choir and Orchestra and the Commonwealth Scholars Choir, Simon Hall, MBE, making music relevant to the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth relevant to music. The Commonwealth Youth Orchestra and Choir is the first and remains the only full-time music organization in the world which works across six continents and throughout all 56 Commonwealth countries. It was established in 2011 and the organization's mission is to use music as a means of international dialogue to create opportunities for in inclusivity and diversity in action, which is embodied in its three-point plan to engage, educate and empower through music. This year saw the establishment of the Commonwealth Music Academy, which was set up to provide new and improved opportunities for both online and residential performing and recording to drive musical engagement throughout the Commonwealth. Through the Academy, the Commonwealth orchestras and choirs will be established in each of the 56 Commonwealth countries. At the moment, these wonderful Commonwealth initiatives don't have access to central funding. The organizations rely on philanthropic support and corporate sponsorship, such as from P&O Cruises, the Malta Tourist Association, PwC and the City of London Corporation up to now. Apart from traditional charitable channels donating to the registered charity, the Commonwealth Youth Orchestra and Choir, the Commonwealth Music Academy Fund has also been set up for donations. So that has a non-country specific fund, as well as 56 country specific funds, one for each Commonwealth country, which can be used to donate directly to each country's talent, choirs and orchestras. This funding supports training, visibility and opportunities for talent at a national level. Donors can benefit from the branded sponsorship opportunities and reap the rewards of associating with such a meaningful international organization and be part of something most importantly to me, I think, which is fundamentally crucial at a grassroots level as well as at international and national levels. So I'm sure when you've heard some of the wonderful music which we're going to be playing today, you're going to agree what a meaningful and worthwhile story this is. So now I'd like to introduce Simon Hoare, the composer in residence of the Commonwealth Orchestras and Choirs, who will be talking to us today. Simon was born in Hertfordshire in the UK and grew up in Devon. His love of music began at the age of eight and he started writing his own music when he was 11 while playing in a brass quintet and later on as a trumpet player in the National Youth Orchestra. At Huddersfield Polytechnic, he studied electroacoustic composition, his work focusing on concrete sounds from which he then crafted music in studio environments. He joined the band of the Welsh Guards a few years later as an instrumentalist, marking the beginning of his 34 year service in the British Army, working with the Welsh Guards, the Prince of Wales Division, the Adjutant General Corps, the Queen's Division, Headquarters Army Music, the Scots Guards, and the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. Currently, Simon is the commanding officer of the Bands of the Household Division. He's also been the director of music for bands, including the Coldstream Guards and the Scots Guards. And during this time, he's composed some wonderful music, including Passchendaele in 2017, which was used to mark the 100th anniversary event of World War I for the BBC, for which he also won a BAFTA award in 2018. During today's event, we'll be sharing some of the Commonwealth music Simon has composed 
and arranged, as well as hearing Simon's thoughts and insights on this music. So Simon, turning to you, would you like to say something about our first piece, which is a song for the Commonwealth? I will do, Julia. And, and first of all, um, it's lovely to see you and thank you very much for your invitation and uh, a warm welcome to our audience online. Song for the Commonwealth was um, perhaps the first piece that um, I was invited to write for Commonwealth music. And it starts a long journey, which I think we're gonna explore this morning. Um, the, the, the song speaks of unity and harmony or the, the need for it within the Commonwealth. Um, and it's a lovely little song written for children of the Commonwealth. And perhaps we uh, play it now. That's wonderful. So Simon, you were awarded first prize for composing a song for the Commonwealth in a Commonwealth music competition and you then became the Commonwealth music ambassador and you've since composed many beautiful Commonwealth related works. So how did you end up entering the Commonwealth music competition exactly? Well, like the best things in life, it all happened by chance. I, I was putting on a large scale outdoor performance in London. Um, and the theme of the production was Commonwealth. And, and we knew that we wanted to finish this performance with a big song talking about the Commonwealth. Um, I'd seen on the Commonwealth Secretariat website in 2016, their narrative. So I thought, well, that's a good starting point for um, the words for a song. Um, and I joined a few dots together with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. I was introduced to the Director General of uh, Commonwealth uh, Youth Orchestra and Choir, Sally Sheppy. And uh, we struck it off straight away. She saw the value in the first draft of this song. Uh, we went on to develop it, perform it in London with the Commonwealth Children's Choir. Um, I think a children's choir of about 300 in central London with a beer orchestra. So it really was a magnificent event. And uh, the rest they say is history. That's amazing. And it clearly means an awful lot to you. And I think also to the Commonwealth Children's um, youth orchestra and choir as well. So did you think at the time that this would be the beginning of a long-term association prior to becoming the uh, Commonwealth's composer in residence, which seems almost the role you're destined for? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I, um, I had an inkling. I got on so well with Sally in the first instance as, as you know, two musicians just sharing our love of music yes yes and, and sally introduced me really to the work of commonwealth youth orchestra and choir and i suppose as a composer i saw the value in in working for them and and perhaps finding you know areas where my music might add a bit more value with um children of the commonwealth and that kind of stuff so it, it all kind of came together very nicely so mentioning children, I think you also told me earlier that um, you began writing music at the age of 11. I think Beethoven didn't even start till he was 12. So what inspired you to write music at such a young age? Can you tell us a little about, bit about yourself and your musical journey? Yeah, well, I, I, I started off as a trumpet player, as I think you've mentioned. Yeah. And um, I can remember a, a brass quintet called Equali Brass visiting where I, I used to live on a concert tour. And they're all principal instrumentalists from the Philharmonia Orchestra, so they were superb. And they inspired me. They were arranging stuff like Romeo and Juliet for brass quintet, which was just amazing. And also they, they were experimenting. They were right on the leading edge. 
So we were doing um, experimental music with electronics in a piece called Equalization. And I think that probably um, stuck with me through life. So they inspired me to write a little bit. And I, I wrote something for brass quintet and then I wrote something for, for solo trumpet and uh, just went on from there, really. I just kind of fell into the love of composing. Wow, I can tell. It's obviously the love of your life. So what are we going to listen to next, Tommy? Um, well, we're going to listen to a little piece called um, April Song from Green Canopy. Um, and it's uh, one of my more recent works. Shall we listen to a little bit and yeah. then we can perhaps yeah. explore it? so peaceful so what's the story behind green canopy and what makes you like april's song in particular okay so um green canopy is a, a work in 12 women's for solo violin and orchestra and it traces the narrative of a woodland in the northern hemisphere all the way from november through to october a bit like the valdi fall seasons um but i i kind of start in in november and each movement um, is stimulated by something that perhaps I've seen in the woodland. So um, it's November's fall, December's end, January's promise, February rising, that's the sap rising through the trees. March is call, so the first um, bird song of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, April's song, which you've just heard, May's breath, which is the, the, the scent on the, on the breeze as it starts to warm up um, through the early uh, summer and, and late spring. June's dance, and why not dance in June? Um, July's celestial heaven, and which tries to depict the, the sunlight through the canopy of trees, almost like stars. August's um, crown, uh, so the crowning glory of the canopy. September's gold. And then um, as we kind of join where we left off, October's turn back to winter. And, right. and that's how it's been put together. And as to April's song, well, um, it's been performed a couple of times now and there's a recording out, um, which you've just heard. And most people say, well, I like April. Um, it's not my particular favorite, but hey, I'm gonna go with a popular vote. Um, uh, so <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> So in the case of this April song, how did you decide which elements you put together to create music? Because when I listen to that, I'm almost transported um, to this green canopy on a peaceful day in spring. So how do you achieve that in your composition? Um, I don't really know, if I'm honest. <laughs> but I'm going to have a stab at it. <laughs> I'll have a stab at it. Um, I mean, in this context, it follows March. So March sets up the first song of, of, of spring. So the, the migrating bird coming back into the woodland. But, but April, um, in a more meaningful way, kind of joins all that together. So the solar violin is, is far more purposeful in its rendition of that song. Um, but the, the, the orchestration um, has lots of other little voices coming in as well, little um, reflections on the main uh, melody. So that's perhaps the other bird song in, in the woodland. And the choice of orchestration. So I, I'm using oboe um, on that second presentation of the first subject. And, you know, that kind of resonates with the woodland as well. Yes, so it does. So there's lots of little things there. It's mm -hmm. all very subjective. I've kind of given you my idea of it, but mm -hmm. I'm sure. Well, it certainly works. It yeah. certainly works. <laughs> So now we're going to hear a different kind of music and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about it before we play To Be A Friend. 
Yeah, so um, To Be A Friend is the second um, song that I was invited to write for um, Commonwealth Children. And it's got a, another little message um, inspired by a bit of Shakespeare helping uh, a friend in need. And, and I think that's a lovely little message for children of the Commonwealth, whether it's, it's helping a friend, a neighbor, or perhaps, you know, when everybody grows up um, later on in life, um, on, on a far grander scale, helping others that are in need. That is truly delightful. I understand that was performed by the Commonwealth Scholars Orchestra and, and the Commonwealth Youth Orchestra, is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So what do you find are the particular joys and, and no doubt challenges of writing and working with children? Um, that, that clip actually missed the punchline of the song, uh, which is someone joins to, to share the burden. Um, <laughs> and I think that the pictures which we've just um, uh, been watching, you know, kind of tell a story there. And, and that's the joy written on the faces of the children singing the song. And, and one of the particular pleasures is, you know, being able to, to write uh, music, which perhaps in some way inspires young people. Um, and there's a, a bit of a journey here from introducing a new piece to children, seeing their comprehension on their, on their faces, starting to learn it, rehearse it, perform it, and then that sense of achievement after a, a performance, perhaps at a, you know, a big venue, um, that's quite a journey. And, and it's lovely to be able to offer that for children. So that's the particular joy of it. Um, the difficulties are perhaps writing something which is simple, um, which is easy to learn and uh, like a worm in your mind, um, a, a melodic worm that just seeds in there and, and, and sticks to you like, like glue. So that's, that's a bit of the secret in terms of composing for children. They've got to um, enjoy it, they've got to love it, they've got to remember it. So um, that's part of the trick, I think. Yes, yes, I suppose it tends to be more, maybe monothematic perhaps in the messaging, I would guess, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I can imagine that children must, um, that the, the experience of being involved in producing music like this must be something which stays with them all their lives, I would imagine. It's a very memorable event for a child. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this song was actually dedicated to Her Majesty the Queen on Commonwealth Day in 2018. And, it, you know, I can see, we can see that there's children gathered from all over the place, um, from all over the Commonwealth, perhaps, to sing this song. So I wondered if you have any first-hand experiences about um, the role of music in uniting people from different walks of life and bringing them together through perhaps a shared love of, and performing of music. I think um, music is a, a common language. It's a universal language. It's with us from the cradle to grave um, and it's all around us, wherever we go, omnipresent. And it's influencing us all the time. I think as a common language, it needs no interpretation. So it's devoid of politics or, or should be, I think, and uh, geography and, and other language. Um, so in that sense, it bring us, brings us together. Yes, um, yes, and perhaps brings these it, cultures into harmony, perhaps. It does, it fuses together. And then the act of listening, if you put an audience in an auditorium of many diff 
different ethnicities and cultures and religions. Through the, the experience of listening to something, they're all focused on a single act. And, and there is a magic there that they are, they are drawn into this singularity. Um, and, and there's a process that there of that comprehension of the audience and, and then their appreciation afterwards. And they don't really know what is happening, um, but there is a shared experience there. And, and then that realization at the end that they've all enjoyed something together. Of um, course, of course. Despite coming from different um, parts of, you know, a country of, of the world of the Commonwealth. Yes, yes. I, I hadn't perhaps focused on that enough in my own mind. It's a very interactive experience, isn't it, to listen to music? Yes, yeah. it's not just the musicians, it's the people listening as well. That's, that's and, a very and, look good at us on, and it's not even a physical audience. Look at us online. You know, we're listening <laughs> to music and the, yeah. there's people from all over the Commonwealth tuned yeah. in here. Yeah. Um, and we're all sharing an experience. Now, we, we'll all have different interpretations of that, um, but I bet there's some common themes. Absolutely, yes. Well, would you like to say a few words about the next piece, which is part of Earth Dance? Yeah, our, our next piece is, is one movement from Earth Dance, which, which is a six movement work written in 2018 to mark the Commonwealth Heads of the Government. And this is Respect. That's, um, that's a very sort of uh, formal, perhaps, piece of music. And, and I understand that you were commissioned um, by Commonwealth Music to produce this, to compose this major work for the 2018 Chogham in London, and yeah. which led to the creation of this beautiful set of compositions, in my view, called Earth Dance, which is a cantata in six parts, I think. Can you tell us more about this particular composition, Respect? It's, it's a very deep sounding piece of music. Yeah, um, uh, the words for Respect are a bit of Shakespeare. It's from Passionate Pilgrim. Um, and th this particular movement is centered on Europe um, and uh, is a very serious message uh, from Shakespeare. Um, and again, it, it, it's, it's the, it's the sentiment which I used for uh, to be a friend, to, to help uh, a friend in need rather than flattering foe. Um, and I, I just think it's a, a beautiful composition. It is, certainly is, yes. So there's been a debate going on, which I've, I've heard about, about which came first, music or speech, or vice, you know, or did speech come before music? And the reason why people say that might have been music first was it's the sort of noises that may have been made, not the, perhaps exactly the sort of music we're listening to now, but rhythm and so on may have come before speech, which sort of, even with that we're having this debate, implies what um, a fundamental part of the sort of human soul, the human condition music is. And I just wondered what your thoughts are about this. Well, that's such a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um... I don't know, I think uh, perhaps, perhaps for me, perhaps um, that sound or musical line or um, melody, even a little fraction of it probably came first. Um, and then it was formed into more of a, a structure with, with um, some kind of, you know, vocabulary put to it in some way. Um, who, who really knows? But the, the two are so intertwined, aren't they? And, then, uh, and even now, as I write music for voice, um, I ponder sometimes whether it's, it's the words that come first or the melody. And do you know what? I interchange those two. So sometimes it is definitely the, the narrative that I'm focusing on and then finding the melody to fit that. But, but you know, other times it, it's that melodic line that's in my mind. Um, and that's what shapes the words or 
kind of stimulates what words might go to it. So, you know, that age old, you know, conundrum there of what came first, chicken or the egg. Yes. Do you know what? It's still playing out today. Yes. And presumably that's part in part because of the deep emotional resonance of the, the whole experience of music, whether you're composing it or listening yeah, to it. Yeah. Yeah. So next, um, we're going to hear from another part of Earth Dance. Um, would you like to tell us something about Empower? Yeah, so this is the, the last movement in this um, six movement work. And um, all, all the movements um, convey uh, different aspects of the Commonwealth. They speak to the core values. So the first movement is called Engage. You've just heard respect, you've got unity, you've got diversity, renew. And then the last movement, Empower. Each movement um, tries to focus on either a dance rhythm or a style, a regional style from, the, from one of the continents of, of the Commonwealth in a very broad term. And, and we've used um, words from um, you know, famous people from around the Commonwealth um, as, as the lyrics for the music. For instance, the first movement, Engage, is from Mahatma Gandhi, um, you must be the change you wish to see. And um, for Empower, uh, I think we were stuck and Sally and I wrote the words for this one. Um, uh, I'm sure they're meaningful. Well, I'll, I'll let you be the judge of that. Shall we yes. listen to a little bit? Yeah. love this piece I feel like applauding actually when it comes to an end it's so uplifting and empowering it's something I feel I like ought to start my day with every day it's fantastic so when you were composing this uh, can you tell us how long it would take you to compose a wonderful piece like this and you, you mentioned before that you don't quite know which comes first the lyrics or the the idea of the melody but um can you describe perhaps how it worked in this particular instance to give us an example? I think we were looking for lyrics uh, with this one. So um, Sally and I conspired together to thrash them out before the melody flowed. And, you know, um, it, it, compositions take different times to write. Sometimes I get stuck and actually I got stuck on this movement. Um, but it, it kind of came out all right at the end and we threw the kitchen sink at, it, at the end or you know, orchestrationally. Um, I actually gave it to a friend as, a, as a, um, a finished composition to say, you know, what do you think? And he says, well, that's very nice. It'll be lovely when it's finished. <laughs> um, which, which is a bit, a bit disconcerting, but actually that, that's the finished piece. Um, so it, it, some, some pieces um, happen very quickly and very intuitively, you know, one of the movements from Earth Dance um, was just written in a couple of hours, and that's the Renew um, uh, movement, which um, depicts a bit of the Pacific. Um, but, but this movement, I, I definitely got stuck on, and, and lots of manuscript ended up in the bin before we came to this final version, even though one of my friends thinks it's unfinished. Well, you know, certainly to me, I certainly couldn't tell. <laughs> It sounds pretty finished to me. I think it's amazing. So how long would it have taken you to have done that, that piece of work? Uh, probably Earth Dance, probably a couple of months, put, put couple. those six movements together. Mm. Yeah, that's actually a relatively short amount of time for such, um, such amount of creativity, I would say. It must be very intense work. Is it tiring or is it invigorating because it's so enlivening to do this? 
I think it, it's both. You know, when something goes smoothly, it, it's the best thing in the world. But I can tell you, when you get stuck on a composition and you just can't find, you know, that melodic line or the harmony, or even define a structure of movement, and you're thrashing away uh, around, you know, seemingly completely at sea, um, it can be the most frustrating thing in the world. You just want to walk away from it. But a bit of perseverance and. Um, so do you use an instrument when you're composing or, or do you, is it mainly in your head? Um, mainly in my head. Um, so for me, you know, lots of walks mm. with the dog um, kind of gets the imagination going. And then um, onto a keyboard and uh, I start to piece it together a bit like a jigsaw. Right, right. So clearly these sort of compositions really support specific Commonwealth narratives, um, particularly in, in this instance. And it seems that there's a great sort of power um, to deliver messages through this kind of music. Uh, do the values of the Commonwealth inspire you when you're doing this composing? Because clearly you would need to buy into them to be able to produce the music around them. Yeah, no, they, they do inspire me. And, and I, I suppose as a composer, any composer, you want your music to be re relevant. Um, so certainly for me, um, I'm not too interested in abstract music. Um, you know, my, my music tries to convey a message. It's very programmatic. Um, I'm using lyrics which um, have a, a deeper meaning in other uh, contexts. Um, so it's about that relevance, and, and yes, it, it is inspiring to write music which perhaps has a purpose. Yes, it certainly does. And just to go back to something I was saying earlier about the size of the music industry, of course it's enormous in relation to entertainment, um, films, plays, advertising and so on. And I think you said to me that music's a bit like witchcraft because without it, films and plays perhaps couldn't be half the magical experiences that they can be with the music. And, you know, the wrong selection of music or the wrong notes can affect the, the mood of a production. So I just wondered if you could share any examples based on your own favourites of how music by composers, whether in film, adverts or other commercial applications, has been such a major reason for the success of that particular um, uh, creative work. Yeah, sure. So uh, what I do is I'll... I'll turn to one of the grand masters of cinematic composing, that's John Williams. Um, mm. I, I expect you remember the film called Jaws? I remember that. <laughs> I mean, everyone will remember it. And yeah. I don't suppose any of us can think of that film without this. Can you hear that? Yes, yeah. Okay, and, and it's, it's such a sinister little thing there. It's a minor second. Um, such a, a dark little um, chordal relationship there between two notes. And, and John Williams lingers on the first note and a shorter second note. All right, and that's almost, I mean, it's subjective, but it's almost, you know, the, the shark sl slithering against your leg, you know, as it glances by. And then he chucks it right down the bottom of the orchestra into the basses and cellos. So he's conveying the depth of the sea there, I think, possibly. And then he puts this rhythm to it. Yes. And I think, I think that's more the travel, the, the journey of the shark, you know, going through the water. And then yes. he puts accents to it, which probably are the, the fin, you know, thrashing about, or, you know, you see the eye through the water. So perhaps that's what the accents are, are bringing out. So, you know, in a sense that the film would be nothing without that, um, but it, in, in his science of music and, and putting those pieces together, those things together, he's, he's conveying a kind of sinister theme through those, that minor second. He's conveying the depth of the sea and perhaps the color of the sea, you know, right down there through the orchestration and the travel through the rhythm and other aspects through through the accents as well. So it's all packed in, in there. Yes, so yes, you're absolutely a, right. And there's this sort of weird unknown feeling about under the sea as yeah. well, and the sort of echoey sounds you might get. Yes, it really brings the emotion alive. It sort of makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck sort of thing, yeah. It does, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely a great example, yes. 
So we're going to move to a very different kind of piece now. Would you like to introduce us to Regina? Yeah, so Regina uh, was written to mark um, the 70th anniversary of the reign of Majesty um, Queen Elizabeth. Um, and it's written in five movements. Um, and I think we're going to listen to um, Cloth of Gold, which is the first yeah. movement, or an excerpt of it. Here we go. I want to take a deep breath after that. So you composed this beautiful piece uh, in early 2021, I think, in honour of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And as you mentioned, it's five movements. And just listening to this, I can hear how much heart and soul has gone into this. And I think you said that the cloth of gold draws on symbols of state as sources of musical inspiration. Can you tell us more about the work and how you wove these ideas into the narrative of the music and, and how it's conveyed through the music? Well, at, at Her Majesty's coronation, she, she wore a, a robe made of um, cloth of gold, a very tightly uh, interwoven uh, fabric of gold. And uh, um, she processes down the abbey um, uh, wearing um, this, this um, uh, cloak. Um, and the music is is very tightly knit. Um, the orchestration weaves in and out uh, with the melodic line and the underpinning parts. And it kind of tries to convey that very tight fabric. Um, and it's a processional. Um, so the, the composition builds from um, you know, almost the entrance of, of Her Majesty um, and then culminates uh, with the arrival um, at, at the throne. Um, as the music just um, develops into a much grander way. Yes, and of course it was televised, wasn't it? The coronation, one of the one of the very yeah. early events that was on television, although most people didn't have their own, that was watched by millions, yes. So is there anything else you can tell us about the sort of very formalistic nature of some of that composing? Because it presumably follows certain types of um, convention, perhaps? Um, yes, and, and perhaps the five movements all touch on elements of that. So I've just described, you know, a, a structural piece which starts small and, and just develops all the way through to a very grand uh, finale and, and very much a processional, a, a journey from one point to another. And um, the second movement is called Grace and, and just depicts the grace of a match the Queen. Um, written for solo violin and is a very um, beautiful and angelic um, uh, piece for solo violin. The third movement is called um, Gloria in Excelsis Deo um, and is very fanfaric and celebratory. Um, the, the fourth movement is, is written um, as a tribute to the late um, the Prince Philip, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. And it's called Consort, mm. and it's just a very simple A B composition uh, with a central section and then a, a recapitulation um, in a very classical sense of a structure. And then the final movement um, is called Regina, and that is almost um, a summary compositionally of, of the Queen's life and is very grand or tries to be very grand and, and inspiring as, as she is. 
That's it's a wonderful, wonderful narrative, I think. So moving on now from uh, su such a quintessentially perhaps um, UK-based event, although watched throughout the Commonwealth, now we're going to expand the music a little bit across the globe from musical influences from different continents and with examples of national anthems which you have done arrangements for. And we've picked Cyprus, India and Kenya. So I wondered if you'd like to say something first about the arrangement of the Cyprus national anthem before we play a short excerpt. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I was invited a few years ago to set some of the national anthems of the Commonwealth, and they are all hidden gems. We don't think of them as as great pieces of music necessarily because they're played in a formal setting as an anthem. Um, but it was just to have to very respectfully, you know, set them in a different context and and perhaps appreciate them more from musical compositions a little bit more. This one for Cyprus, um, the, the Cyprus anthem is, is gorgeous, but yes. quite hymn-like. Um, but here this presentation is almost set in a bit of a party, an outdoor dance, a celebration with a piccolo playing, a, a piccolo, piccolo flute, piccolo trumpet. I think there's a tambourine in there and a few drums. So it's a big celebration in Cyprus. That's so lively and upbeat. It's just like this beautiful island itself and all its energy, isn't it? I can tell where yeah. that, some of that thought went, what process must have come from in that arrangement. So which anthem is next? Um, so next is the Indian National Anthem. Mm -hmm. And um, this particular setting inspired by a, a setting by Raman, a very famous Indian composer, film composer, pop composer. He did a, a, such a beautiful setting of the Indian National Anthem. Um, using lots of uh, traditional instruments, um, but also lots of voices from all generations um, of society. And it's just such a fabulous setting. And here with it, this uh, particular setting that, that uh, we did, I just wanted to pay homage to that in a very respectful way um, and utilizing some of the instruments that we had to hand. Wow, how did you capture these tones and echoes of the Indian music um, using Western style instruments? How did you achieve that kind of echo of the sound of something like a sitar? Well, I think all the fundamentals uh, are all there, what, whatever instrument. Um, so a bit of witchcraft going on there, a bit <laughs> of bending of notes and there's wind chimes in there and um, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's very haunting, it's wonderful. So we're now going to hop over to Africa and hear a short excerpt from the Kenyan National Anthem. Would you like to say something briefly about this? So um, Africa is somewhere I have traveled extensively and I have visited Kenya. It's such a beautiful country. Um, and this is a, a very beautiful anthem, um, uh, quite somber and, and um, you know, rich. Um, and I, I suppose uh, I love the music and I tried to set that very re respectfully and perhaps inspired by some of the colors that I might have seen. So I'm focusing here on oboe and clarinet um, to tr try and convey a sense of that color. 
Um, we're going to hear a, just the opening of it, which is set in a very small way, but um, the whole composition does open out in a very grand finish. So if you get an opportunity, it's worth listening to the whole setting. Thank you. Wow, that is haunting and mellow, I think. Um, so what what was your, you, you mentioned that you've traveled in Kenya and, and, and what went into this, but I wondered if there was a particular thought process in, in the opening of this piece, of the arrangement here. Um, well, I, I suppose fragile, the, the, the oboe is, is very singular voice there in that setting. Um, uh, so presenting the, the melody in that fragile way. Mm -hmm. But of course, as the composition grows, I'm, I'm adding far more voices to it. So perhaps a single voice, um, just in a very hauntingly way, as you put it, um, announcing this, this melody. But then the composition grows as many more people join into this big chorus towards the end. Well, I'm sure we will all seek that out and listen to it. it the um, opening bars are certainly... Um, very, very moving. So now we'll move to the penultimate piece of music. Um, and what would you like to say about um, the Cenotaph Requiem Sanctus? Well, um, Sally had, had been persuading me to write a piece to mark the cent centenary of the end of uh, the First World War. And I was very reluctant to do so for, for many months. But finally, I I said, okay, I, I, I will do it, I'll write a piece. And then before I knew where we were, we were writing a whole Requiem of 11 movements. This is one movement called Sanctus, and, and perhaps we can listen to a little bit of that. that's deep it's dignified it's polished and for me um like many british and commonwealth people i think that the experience of world war one is possibly in my dna uh, i think a lot of families were very deeply affected by it my grandfather was mobilized on the first day of world war one because he was in the territorial army and he spent the entire war in the uh, um, in the field horse um, army regiment where he they went out to collect the wounded or in fact dead the dead I think from the battlefields and I was brought up listening to stories about um, Hellfire Corner and the Menin Road and so on. So what, what was your reluctance to write this about about World War I? Um, I think many composers um, through time have written um, works of a significant event. And I think that's quite a big thing to do. And, and I suppose I was a little hesitant in, in trying to write something which marked one of the most significant um, events in, in recent history. Um, so part of, the, part of that was at play. Um, and hence then, you know, thinking, right, well, let's write a requiem then, because, mm -hmm. you know, what else can you possibly um, do for such um, an enormous time in our history. Um, 
and so that that's what I did. Of course, there's a lot of poetry around World War One, isn't there? And it's quite bitter the poetry, a lot of it. And yeah. but what we were just listening to, it starts as quite solemn, but the, it almost becomes triumphant. Um, what 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 feelings were you conveying there? Um, well, I I shared a draft with a friend, um, and he said, "Well, no, no, that, that's that's no good at all." He says, "You know, Sanctus is very grand. It's mm. it's, it's big music." Um, so I, I redrafted it, and um, I, I, inspired by the words, um, Hosanna in the highest, so the, the music climbs, it reaches to the vaults of the cathedral, and we're looking at the stained glass windows in that um, uh, clip there, which tells its own story. And I, I put the trumpet player up on top Ds and E flats, and for anyone who's plays the trumpet, that's quite difficult to do. And um, he recorded it so well, a chap called Martin Hinton, a um, brilliant trumpet player. So I think he, he conveyed that so well, played it brilliantly. Um, so the music does, you know, kind of climb to the heavens, Hosanna in the highest. Yes, and yes. And hopefully that, that was conveyed. Yeah, I, I, get, I get the sense that, I mean, a lot of the, the poetry is about the futility of World War I, but with, with this piece, I get the, the feeling that, well, there was massive sacrifice, but you know there, there was an element that that the sacrifice wasn't in vain, and you know that's a very positive message to be able to take from World War One, I, I think. Yeah, and then, and there is you know a well trodden phrase, um, and I don't say this in a trite way, but there is hope in sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Hope that there are those people um, who are willing to lay down their lives uh, for other people in the service of other people, and that is such a magnificent thing. It and, is. And we, we saw that played out um, in the First World War um, yeah. and, and, you know, subsequent wars and, and before that time. Um, so that, that is such a unique thing of the human condition that people are willing to lay down their life. Yeah, it's a very valuable interpretation of, of in this music. It's fantastic. So turning now to the final piece we're going to listen to, this I saved this to last, is my personal favourite, probably because of my pop music uh, tastes. I love it. Um, it's a wonderfully energetic piece, Believe. It's rich and touching. And would you like to say something about it before we play this great, um, magnificent piece of music? OK, so Believe was the third in a trilogy of songs for children of the Commonwealth. And um, this particular message is about um, aspiring to become anything that you wish to in life. Um, but the only real ingredient, apart from bitter determination and opportunity, is you've got to believe in yourself. And so here's the song Believe. Run, seek, and find who you are. Run, seek, and find who you are. There's nothing you can. I love that so much. It really encapsulates such feelings of hope that you can achieve anything that you set your heart on. And you obviously gathered children and the amazingly talented Misha Paris with her gospel singing background to perform at Abbey Road Studios. Um, how was that? How was the experience of doing that? Oh, it was a brilliant day. I think we had 186 musicians packed into studio to Abbey Road, which isn't a huge studio. But of course, um, there's been such iconic composers and conductors and bands 
that have all recorded in Abbey Road. So to spend a day there with the children, Commonwealth Scholars Choir, Orchestra, uh, was such a magnificent experience. And uh, I loved every, every minute of it. And I think you can see from the faces of the children and the Scholars Choir, everyone was loving it. Yes, it absolutely comes together. It makes you want to sort of swing to the music, actually. Yeah. So what was your inspiration for both the lyrics and the composition uh, of this piece? Um, it, it, I think within that trilogy of, of songs for children, it, it was just finding an, another way of seeding an important life message. So we'd already talked in the first song about the, the, the importance of unity and harmony in the Commonwealth. And um, the second song about um, true friendship and helping someone in need. Um, and, and really working with children from the Commonwealth. And I do a lot of work um, through Sally Shabby in, in East London with children there from all kinds of backgrounds, um, um, ethnic, ethnicities and cultures that perhaps haven't had the best um, start in life. Um, but the message to them is, you know, hey, you know, with that determination, self to believe, you can achieve anything in life. So it was just, you know, a series of messages that we we are conveying to the children that hopefully will stick with them as they grow up and as they find their way through life. And who knows? You know, maybe some of them will be prime ministers and, um, you know, presidents one day. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. If I listen to that enough. So when you're in the middle of leading the choir and the orchestra, creating that music in the studio, was there any moment at which you felt you were exactly where you were meant to be at that time? Or were you just so focused on your work and what you were doing that you didn't have time to, for that thought to come through your head? Well, I think if, if anyone from that recording session um, says anything, they'll say that Simon had a smile on his face from the moment he walked in to the moment he walked out. <laughs> It was just the place to be. I would sleep there if I could. <laughs> I think that says it all. So what do you have in store for the Commonwealth Youth Orchestra and Choir and the Scholars Choir and the Children's Orchestra and Choir and the Music Academy? You know, what, what's coming next for them? Um, well, we, we haven't got, um, certainly for me, I, I haven't got any planned compositions at the moment, but if there are any suggestions from anyone out there, I'm happy to take some ideas. We, we are formalizing a lot of the work that's um, been ongoing with Commonwealth Youth Orchestra and Choir. So for many years, um, we've been offering online courses, residential courses, competitions, and really engaging through music um, right across the whole Commonwealth. Um, but now we, we are um, formalizing that within a um, Commonwealth Music Academy, where we are seeking to, in a more meaningful and structured way, um, educate through um, early years and tertiary education and um, do some more formal training in, in instrumental, um, um, instrumentalists, um, orchestral writing, composition, recording, etc. Et um, so it's really offering at grassroots level fully funded opportunities um, for engaging with people across all 56 nations of the Commonwealth. Of course, that takes money. And, and so we are um, trying to develop um, uh, the funding to, to be able to enable those fully funded um, opportunities at grassroots level. That takes time. And, and hopefully, if anything um, today has helped, then the music that we've been writing, and I'm just one of um, many composers from across the Commonwealth that are writing music, which are you know, hopefully adding value um, and inspiring people. So hopefully, you know, music like this um, does inspire um, your audience here and, and perhaps help us find ways of, of funding um, this work as we move on into the future. That certainly inspires me. Um, I have some questions that people have sent in, so I'll just pick a few of them out if that's all right, Simon. So here's sure. a question. Which is your favorite, personal favorite musical instrument and why? Well, it's gotta be the trumpet. Yes, I thought you'd <laughs> I'm, I'm a slave to the trumpet. Um, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd probably cello, if I'm honest, because I think that's so close to the voice. It really does speak. Yes, yes. And another question. 
Why are you not on social media? What if fans want to follow or talk to you? Um, well, I, I've got a Twitter account, but I don't use it much. I'm, mm. I'm terrible for social media. I kind of um, hide myself away and, and let the music do its uh, yeah. speaking. Yes, I think um, I think the composition well, and creative process doesn't really go with interacting on social media, does it? No, but maybe it's something that I should learn to um, learn to love, maybe. Certainly someone out there thinks that. <laughs> okay. So here's another one. Um, are you familiar with video game musical composers, including Harry Gregson Williams? Compositions similar to yours are truly the lifeblood of game ambience. I wonder if you would ever consider contributing one of your beautiful works to the video gaming community. That would be awesome. No, I, I would love to. And I, I'm very aware of that industry as well. And, and there are lots of, and I don't put myself in this league, but lots of serious composers um, that are all contributing to the uh, video gaming um, industry, such like um, Hans Zimmer um, is writing uh, or using some of his music for video games. So I'd, I'd love to get into it. Um, if someone's got a, an idea out there about how something that you've perhaps heard might be incorporate, incorporated in, 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 into a video game, not death and, and, and murder and everything like that. <laughs> so uh, no call of duty, but um, I'm sure there is something out there, yeah. Oh, I don't know how many Commonwealth video games there are. Maybe we need to you know, race to the Commonwealth, Pirates of the yeah, Commonwealth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's another question. As the, quote, Commonwealth composer, unquote, have you been influenced by any particular European composers? You use minor keys a good deal. Do you have a favourite? I, I do. Um, I love minor keys. Every composer does. Um, because it conveys such seriousness, I, I think, and I, I kind of avoid a lot of major keys. I mean, um, Empower is in a major key. Um, but uh, yeah, I, inspired by Brahms, um, if I picked a piece which kind of resonated in the minor key, it would be Brahms three and the, and the slow movement, the, the beautiful cello theme. And if anyone knows that, um, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, Look it up because it is the most beautiful piece of writing um, ever. Thank you. And perhaps we'll make this the last question I pick up. Um, which are your favorite musicians' inspiration? Um, musicians? Mm. Oh. Um, Daniel Barenboim. Um, I, I love the music of uh, John Williams, um, Arm Zimmer, I, I follow Max Richter. Um, lots of classical um, composers. Um, I'm, I'm not focusing on instrumentalists, am I? I'm probably no. on composers. Um, I love the Vivaldi, and, and perhaps you know that's where I started off. You know, listening to the Four Seasons and programmatic music, uh, Beethoven, Beethoven Six, um, Scherzard. So all these pieces which um, convey a story, I'm kind of drawn to. Um, so perhaps, perhaps that, that's where my love is. So a final question from me. Um, your story is an amazing one because you've made a career and a very successful one and you've shared so much of what you're good at and what you love in music. But a lot of people perhaps starting out on the path of music would be discouraged and they'd be told it's a very tough world out there. What would you say to a teenager who wants to become a composer or perhaps a professional music musician what would you say to them now I, I would say don't be discouraged to to put pen to paper to to walk along a pathway and let a um, something inspire you whether it's the rustle in the trees a bit of bird song um, whether, whether it's the crowd you're walking through and, and the hubbub of that um, you know the collection of people let, let something enter your head and, and just write down, you know, what you, what you think that means to you and make a start in life. And, and who knows where that might grow. So believe in yourself. So there we go. We're back to the song. Um, but make a start and, and see where um, life takes you. Thank you. Well, on that optimistic note, Simon, thank you so much for joining the Commonwealth Chamber today and sharing us uh, with us your story. 
uh, and, and in particular the Commonwealth story and the wonderful work that the Commonwealth Youth Orchestra and Choir and the Music Academy and so on are doing. And I do hope we'll see more of your inspiring work and I hope that we'll catch up with you and the Commonwealth um, Music Organisations again in the not too distant future. I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined us today for um, being with us. So I wish you all a lovely day and hope to see you again soon. Bye, bye. Roads you can find who you are Roads you can find who you are There's nothing you can't do Believe it could be you There's nothing Shoreline to the mountain